Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So today we'll take a look at Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 7, Chapter 7, oh, where'd it go? Text uh, 35 and 36. Oh, here we go. Oh, it couldn't be farther apart. Uh, text 35. Yada. Grahagrista, Eva, Quachit, Dasati, Akrandate, Kayati, Bandate, Janam, Muhu, Shvasan, Vakti, Hare, Jagatpate, Narayaneti, Atmamati, Gata Trapa, Dravida Prabhu, some advice about how to negotiate 
Well, I guess it would be, it would just, it's just an extra syllable there, huh? Yadagrasta eva kvachidasati. Yeah, just, it's an I. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what it is, so. It's just a Y for Sunday. Yadagraha grasta eva kvachidasati. Akrandate jayati vandate janam. Muhushvasan bhakti hare jagat pate. Narayane tyatma mutir gata prapaha. Yadagraha grasta eva kvachidasati. Akrandate dhyayati vandate janam. Mahushvasan bhakti hare jagat pate. Narayane tyatma matir gatap chapaha. Yadagraha grasta evad kvachat kvachidasati. Akrandate dhyayati vandate janam. Muhushvasang bhakti hare jagat pate. Narayane tyatma matir gata trapa. Yada Grahasta Iva Quachadis, sir. Yada Janam. Muhuswa Muhuswa Samanti Hare Jagat Pate Shasamakti Hare Jagat Pate Narayane Tiatmana Matir Gati Trapaha Anyone else? Word to word. Ta da! At that time. Puman. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking at 36. Sorry. 
Yada. Yada. When? when? Grahagrastha. Haunted, Haunted by a ghost. Eva. Eva. Like. like. Kvachit. 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 Sometimes. Sometimes. Hasati. Hasati. Laughs. Laughs. Akrandate. Cries loudly. Remembering the transcendental qualities of the Lord. Dhyayate meditates. Vandate offers respects. Janam to all living entities. Thinking of them to be engaged in the service of the Lord. Muhu constantly. Shvasan breathing heavily. Vakti, he speaks. Hare, O oh my Lord. Jagatpate, O oh Master of the whole world. Narayana, O oh Lord Narayana. Iti, thus. Atma Matihi. Fully absorbed in thoughts of the Supreme Lord. Gata Trapa, without shame. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. When a devotee becomes like a person haunted by a ghost, He laughs and very loudly chants about the qualities of the Lord. Sometimes he sits to perform meditation and he offers respects to every living entity, considering him to be a devotee of the Lord. Constantly breathing very heavily, he becomes careless of social etiquette and loudly chants like a madman. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, O oh my Lord, O oh Master of the Universe. Okay, now it's our turn. Uh, responsively, please. When a devotee becomes like a person haunted by a ghost, when a devotee becomes a person haunted by a ghost, he laughs and very loudly chants about the qualities of the Lord. Sometimes he sits to perform meditation. And he offers respects to every living entity, considering him to be a devotee of the Lord, constantly breathing very heavily. He becomes careless of social etiquette and, la uh, chants, and loudly chants like a madman. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Oh, my Lord. Oh, Master of the Universe. Srila Prabhupada's purport. When one chants the holy name of the Lord in ecstasy, not caring for outward social conventions, it is to be understood that he is Atma Mati. In other words, his consciousness is turned toward the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Uh, text 36. Now, text 36. Tada puman mukta samasta bantanas tad bhava bhavanu kritasyak kritasyaya kritihi nirdagdha bijanu shayo mahiyasha pakti prayogena samityad hokshajam. The devotee is then freed from all material contamination because he constantly thinks of the Lord's pastimes and because his mind and body have been converted to spiritual qualities. Uh, yeah, he's doing it again. Sorry. Oops. Because of his intense devotional service, his ignorance, material consciousness, and all kinds of material desires have been 
complete, uh, are completely burnt to ashes. This is the stage at which one can achieve the shelter of the Lord's lotus feet. Srila Prabhupada's purport. When a devotee is completely purified, he becomes anyabhilashita shunyam. In other words, all of his material desires become zero, being burnt to ashes, and he exists um, either as the Lord's servant, friend, ma uh, father, mother, or conjugal lover. Because one thinks constantly in this way, one's present material body and mind are fully spiritualized, and the needs of one's material body completely vanish from one's existence. An iron rod put into a fire becomes warmer and warmer, and when it is red hot, it is no longer an iron rod, but fire. Similarly, when a devotee constantly engages in devotional service and thinks of the Lord in his original Krishna consciousness, he, is no, he no longer has any material activities, for his body is spiritualized. Advancement in Krishna consciousness is very powerful. And therefore, even during this life, such a devotee has achieved the shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. This transcendental ecstatic existence of a devotee was completely exhibited by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. In this regard, Srila Madhvacharya writes as follows, Tadbhava bhava yayatasvarupam bhakti ke chid bhakti vinrityanti gayanti cha yatepsitam kechit tushnam japantyeva kechit shobhaya karina. The ecstatic condition of uh, devotional service was completely exhibited by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who sometimes danced, sometimes cried, sometimes sang, and sometimes remained silent, and sometimes chanted the holy name of the Lord. That is perfect spiritual existence. O Magnana Timirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshuran Militange Natasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Mukankaroti Vachalam Pangum Langhayate Gidim Jatkripa Tamahang Bande Sri Gurundi Nataranam Sri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtang Stapitang Yena Bhutale Svayam Rupakadama Hyang Dadati Svapadantikam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhaktivedanta Swamini Tinamine Namaste Saraswate Deve Yorvani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatide Shatarine Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyas Chakrapa Sindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Nama Just read the translations again. When a devotee becomes like a person haunted by a ghost, he laughs and very loudly chants about the qualities of the Lord. Sometimes he sits to perform meditation and he offers respects to every living entity, considering him to be a devotee of the Lord, constantly breathing very heavily. He becomes careless of social etiquette and loudly chants like a madman. Hare Krishna, Hare, Hare Krishna. Krishna. Oh, my Lord, O oh Master of the Universe. That's a good song scar to have. <laughs> and when you hear the holy name, it spontaneously erupts from your body. There you are. Chad, you're right here in these verses, huh? The devotee is then freed from all material contamination because he constantly thinks of the Lord's pastimes and because his mind and body have been converted to spiritual qualities. Okay, I'm going to try it again so I don't forget. Because of his intense devotional service, his ignorance, material consciousness, and all kinds of material desires are completely burnt to ashes. 
This is the stage at which one can achieve the shelter of the Lord's lotus feet. There's so much going on in these verses. And uh, I'm in big trouble just thinking about all the places to go. Really hoping that the Lord, my divine guardians, and all of you will kind of like guide me a little bit. Um, there's an evocative word in text 35 that I'm going to phrase that I'm going to come back to. Um, but one thing we see here, it's really interesting. If you go back a couple of verses to... Oh, no, it's not that far. Oh, well, just the previous verse, text 34. I thought it might be further back. Um, one who is situated in devotional service is certainly the controller of his senses. But what we see, apparently, is that by, when, when one actually has control over their senses and they, are, um, they come to this platform, I mean, what's being described here? This is, this is bhava, at least, right? This happens, this, these kinds of things happen at the stage of bhava. So what happens? You lose control of your mind and senses. Your mind is spontaneously, constantly fixed on uh, meditation on the Lord's name, form, qualities, and pastimes. And... This, we see here also symptoms of the Uttama Vaishnava, right? I mean, we have, see in the 11th canto, the, the uh, Kanishta Vaishnava, kind of very narrow-minded, very sectarian. They have some reverence for God, but they think God lives in their church. You know, God, Krishna lives in my Sangha, and the others are all bogus, all nonsense. Um, the people who go to my church, they're God's people, and everyone else is lost. Um, and then you have the uh, Madhyama Vaishnavas who see four broad categories. They see the Lord, they see the devotees, they see those who are innocent, those who haven't gotten bhakti yet, and uh, those who are envious, the atheists. Sam Harris, Dan Dennett, um, what's that guy's name? Dawkins. Um, you know, these people. And they behave differently. They're able to discriminate. This is proper discrimination. And then they behave differently with each. Brahma Maitri Kripa Upeksha. They love uh, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They make friendship with the devotees. Uh, they're merciful, compassionate, kind to those who haven't uh, uh, actually been enlightened yet. Uh, and for those who are um, actually inimical to the Lord, they don't bother. Who picks They neglect them. No time. I mean, Prabhupada used to tell us, uh, don't preach to people who are too intoxicated. I mean, they're not going to remember anything anyway. So what's the point? Uh, they may just argue with you, or they may, you know, kind of like uh, you know, agree with you superficially, but they're not going to, you know, there's not going to have any effect. And then the Uttama Vaishnavas, uh, the, the superlative Vaishnava, they see Krishna everywhere and in everything. And they see everybody engaged in devotional service better than they. So who's, who is there for them to give mercy to? Well, actually everybody, but... That's not their perspective. Um, their perspective is that they need everyone else's mercy so they can attain to, vote, to, to pure devotional service. So, um, there is a sense in which we could say we lose control of our senses in bhava and prema. Um, 
a couple of other places, I, my mind, anyway. So, um, so that's, that's one thing to consider. And so we see, uh, we see this described in Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Shikshastakam. Uh, I was talking yesterday about um, that um, last uh, chapter of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, where uh, Srila Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami takes those eight verses and arranges them in actually a progressive uh, pattern, um, going from, well, what are the overall benefits of the chanting of the holy name, um, and then descriptions of each of the stages that unfolds um, as we progressively chant, in the holy, chant the holy name of the Lord, from Shraddha to Prema. So here we have um, a description of bhava. Yugayitam nimeshena chakshusha pravrishayitam sunyayitam jagat sarvam govinda virahename. Lord Chaitanya is praying, my Lord Govinda, because of separation for you. Oh, that's the wrong darn verse. I did it again. I was thinking of text 36. Nayanam galara sudharaya varanam gadgada rudhaya kira pulakaya nichitam vapukada tava namagrahane bhavishyati. Where is Grahane? So, my dear Lord, when will my eyes be beautified? So here he's hankering for, you know, for this, this stage of bhava. When will my eyes be beautified by filling with tears that constantly glide down as I chant your holy name? When will my voice falter and all the hairs on my body stand erect in transcendental happiness as I, I chant your holy name? And then Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami um, elaborates a little bit, having, the Maha, having Mahaprabhu reflect, without love of Godhead, my life is useless. Therefore, I pray to you to accept me as your servant and give me the salary of ecstatic love of God. And then he explains, separate, and then this is a transition to the next verse. Uh, separation from Krishna awoke various mellows of distress, lamentation, and humility. Thus, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spoke like a crazy man. And then we see this practically, we see this expressed practically um, in Lord Chaitanya's dancing in the uh, Ratiatra festivals, during the Kirtans and the Ratiatra festival. Um, so uh, we. Oh. Well, I seem to have lost my place again. Uh, quick check. Uh, pardon me. Oops. Okay. So. Oh, well, that's uh, that's just the wrong verse. But we see in how Lord Chaitanya exhibited all these symptoms when he was dancing in the Ratiatra. Uh, we see those described in um, you know in uh, when this is uh, related in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. Oh, I may actually finish on time because I lost those verses. Um, so this, you know, this is actually um, the goal of our practice, our sadhana. The goal is, is to attain bhava. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, a few days ago that bhakti comes from, well, maybe it was here, maybe it was somewhere else now that I think about it, that bhakti comes from bhakti. The 11th canto tells us bhaktiya sanjataya bhaktiya. And there are a couple of ways to understand that that uh, phrase, that pada there, that uh, uh, bhakti is ahoituki 
uh, apratihata, as we see earlier in the Bhagavatam, that it doesn't have any cause other than itself. So we get bhakti from the bhaktas. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur uh, uh, explains this at the beginning of uh, his Madhurya Kadambani. Um, we get bhakti from the bhaktas. So we get our sadhana, we get our practice from the guru, our gurus. Um, and we're, when, in the, when we keep ourselves in the association of devotees, we're constantly sharing our bhakti with each other. Bhakti is like a virus, happy virus. Hmm? A, bacteria, a bacteria. No, Kaimi's good at that. He's quick. Um, so, you know, we're constantly sharing, but we essentially, you know, originally we get it, you know, we get it from our, from our gurus. Um, and it grows. And that sadhana bhakti that we get from them develops, into, as I was mentioning the other day, into bhava bhakti, which grows into uh, prema bhakti. So, where was I going to go next? So, bhaktiya sanjataya bhaktiya. So, we want to keep ourselves in the association of devotees so that we always have this... Um, we keep ourselves immersed in the, in the bacteria, the bacterial virus. It's like a fusion, I guess. Um, there's a, there's a, um, a phrase in, in text 36. Uh, so I'm sorry, text, there are a couple of phrases in text 35 that caught my eye, but there was something in text 36 that also caught my eye. Oh, yes. Um, it says the devotee is then freed from all material contaminations because he constantly thinks of the Lord's pastimes and because his body and mind have been converted to spiritual qualities. So this made me think of uh, something else from the Antilila of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. So we know how when Sanatana Goswami um, traveled from Vrindavan to Jagannath Puri um, to get darshan of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he picked up um, some kind of illness, some kind of virus or something um, in, from bad water in, in the forest of Charikanda. And he had, his body was covered with oozing sores. Prabhupada describes it someplace as psoriasis. Um, is it psoriasis? The heartbreak of psoriasis. There's old commercials on TV back in the olden days. Anyway, psoriasis, uh, or one of those things that really worries people, you're going to keep a, jar, a tube of ointment in your medicine cabinet. So when he got to Puri, because he was covered with all these, he's reflect, all these oozing sores, he's reflecting on how affectionate the Lord was, always was with him beginning from their very first meeting. You know, every, very first meeting, Lord Chaitanya threw those long arms of his around Sanatan and drew him to his breast in a very tight, loving embrace. And so he just thought, not going to go near Lord Chaitanya because I know what's going to happen. And I don't, it's just, just thinking about it grosses me out. And not even going to go near the temple because I don't want to freak out the pandas. Uh, they don't, you know, they're afraid of, I'm, I'm, you know, if they see that my shadow fall on them, they might have to go take a bath or something. So he stayed with uh, Thakur Haridas. Uh, however, Lord Chaitanya would come to see him. And um, so we see in the fourth chapter, Lord Chaitanya comes and, and he's explaining, you know, okay, so you're staying away from me because of this, these sores. He says, but look, a mom doesn't get, you know, she doesn't fall apart, um, you know, when she, if, you know, if her baby um, she she's on her or passes stool on her or something like that. It's just, you know, it's just, or, you know, it's love. It's a burden of love. And he said, and, and what kind of person would I be if I didn't love you just because you have these sores? Um, that just doesn't make any sense. And then he, you know, and he, he could understand what Sanatan's 
idea was, because Sanatana was thinking this body's become useless, I'm going to throw it away. I'm going to get rid of it, get a new one, start over again. So he had a plan that when the Ratyatra festival came, he would throw himself under the wheel of Lord Jagannath's cart as a sort of spiritual suicide. Raghunath Das Goswami had a similar idea at one point. He wanted to throw himself off Govardhan. So Lord Chaitanya talked Sanatana down off this cliff by instructing him. One, no one should ever think that a devotee's body is material. Never. And he says, at the time of initiation, as we engage uh, in self-surrender, the devotee's body becomes accepted as the, by, by the Lord as being as good as his, as, as his own. The phrase he uses is atmasam, the same as his own. And in a couple of verses surrounding that verse, two verses, Lord Chaitanya describes the devotee's body as chidanandamoy, being constituted of spiritual substance. Now, he's not talking about our siddhadeha. He's not talking about our spiritual body in the sense of siddhadeha. But he's talking about our spiritualized body. And Srila Prabhupada uses, um, so in other words, the sadhaka deha. And Srila Prabhupada makes uh, some reference to this. You know, he ex kind of explains this in his purport with an example that we hear all the time. If you put an iron rod in a hot enough fire, although it kind of still looks in, like an iron rod, and you could still use it as an iron rod, for all practical purposes, it's become fire. It's like fire. It'll illuminate, it'll warm, you can, you can ignite things with it. So this is the sadhaka deha. And so he's telling uh, Sanatana Goswami, you know, this is your sadhaka deha, you got to take care of it. And he says, because I have things that I intend to accomplish with this body. And we see what Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu accomplished with Sanatana Goswami's body. So many wonderful things. Uh, we're all the beneficiaries of those things. And then he told him, besides, that's not your body anymore to do with as you like, because you surrendered it to me. It's mine, and I've got plans for it, so just take it easy. And then he embraced him, and all the sores went away. Now, there's a phrase in uh, text 35 that caught my eye which brought me closer to actually asking to give class than I have ever been in the 55 years I've been associating with it. I don't ask to give class. But yesterday, yesterday or the other day, you know, I, I, you know, I thought, oh, I really, oh, no. Then when they were asking who will give class today, I said, I really like that verse. And that uh, phrase is, because this is a whole different, a whole other one of my themes, he says, yada graha grasta evatkva chidda sati. Um, when he, be la he becomes crazy, like a person haunted by a ghost. And this brings me to one of my favorite, uh, out of eight, one of my 18,000 favorite verses in the Bhagavatam. <laughs> um, this is in text, uh, this is text 19 in chapter 5. I, you, I often couple it with text 17 to make a different point, but I just want to, I just want to make this one, uh, one point. Um, <clears throat> this is a very famous verse. We hear it recited less than verse 17. Um, this is, Navai janu jatu katancha navrajen mukunda sevyan vayaranga sangsritim smaran mukundangri upaguhanam punar. There's that word again, graha, haunted. So, um, Shula, my dear Vyas, all, even though a devotee of Lord Krishna sometimes falls down, somehow or other, he certainly does not undergo material existence like others, the fruit of workers, etc. Because a person who's once relished the taste of the lotus feet of the Lord can do nothing but remember that ecstasy again and again. I'll read a paragraph of... Sh well, I'll read a little bit of Prabhupada's purport because I really want to go 
We'll, we'll see the difference in, in, in their language. I mentioned recently that um, sometimes, uh, when, even when Srila Prabhupada draws directly from Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's tikas, his commentaries, Prabhupada's language is more restrained. So we'll see that here. Uh, 1519. A devotee of the Lord automatically becomes uninterested in the enchantment of material existence because he, he is rasagraha, or one who has tasted the sweetness of the lotus feet of Krishna. There are many instances where devotees of the Lord have fallen down due to uncongenial association, just like fruitive workers who are always prone to degradation. But even though he falls down, a devotee is never to be considered the same as a fallen karmi. A karmi re uh, suffers the result of his own fruit of actions, whereas a devotee is reformed by chastisement directed by the Lord himself. And, and he goes on, and I recommend that everyone read this uh, verse and purport at least on ekadashis or something, if not once a week, if not every day. Uh, because Srila Prabhupada's purport is so amazing and, and, gen and generous, because this verse shows the generous and, s and extremely powerful nature of bhakti. So here's Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary on that verse. This verse elaborates the point that there's no misfortune for a devotee. Even if overcome because of poor determination, Srila Prabhupada says uncongenial association twice in his purport. Vishwanath says uh, poor determination. I think the two go hand in hand. That person, never, that person who serves Mukunda never returns to Sangsara, the place of enjoying the results of karma, whereas those practicing karma do return. That is because he does not experience happiness and distress from karmas, since he experiences only the fruits of happiness and distress directly given by the Lord. And then he cites uh, a line from, uh, oh, prayers by the personified Vedas. When a person realizes you, he no longer cares about his good and bad fortune arising from past pious and sinful acts, since it is you alone who control his good and bad fortune. And then a line from Padma Purana. Nakarma uh, bandhanam janma vaishnavanam chavindite. The Vaishnavas do not have rebirth caused by karma. Then he continues, <clears throat> remembering from previous practice alone the mental embrace, upaguhanam, of the Lord's lotus feet, he has no desire to give that up. The verse does not say remembering his lotus feet, but rather remembering the embrace of his lotus feet. When I think of this, I think of service to his lotus feet, the, the um, ecstasy that the devotee experiences serving the Lord's lotus feet. Oh, and who lives at the Lord's lotus feet? The Vaishnavas, right? The devotees. So serving them as well. And the... Um, and the word again is used. The implication of these two words is that even though he may give up by his own choice the worship once, twice, or three times because of poor determination, after some time, by remember his, remembering his previous state of bliss um, from remembering the Lord and also remembering his present state of distress from not remembering the Lord, he repents. Oh, Oh, what have I foolishly done? Let that be. I will not again abandoning, ab abandon worship of the Lord. He again begins worshiping the Lord. The verse also uses the phrase, does not desire to give up, instead of does not give up. This implies that he desires that he be devoid of pride in his practice. He acknowledges that he's made of mercy. Um, the accomplishment is in the hands of the Lord. You know, if I have any success, it's just Krishna's mercy. It's the mercy of my gurus. It's the mercy of the Vaishnavas who are always supporting me in my practice. And then he says, I think it's time to buckle up here. Rasagraha means one who is eager for tasting or one who has a taste which is something like a ghost which cannot be given up. 
haunted by Russia. The, and then I, 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 meant, I meant to ask Banu Swami about, uh, about this. He says, the meaning is then that the worship of the uh, after stages of Nishta Ruchi and Asakti, in other words, Bhava, becomes actual rasa at the stage of rati. And I think he's presenting that as a sort of doubt, as a sangshaya. In case you're thinking that, because then he says, however, even from the first day of worshiping the Lord, there's certainly a portion of tasting rasa in a very covered form. Thus it is said, bhakti pareshana bhavo viraktiran yatra chaisha tri eka kalaha Devotion, direct experience of the Supreme Lord, and detachment from other things. These three occur simultaneously, and I would add progressively, for one who has taken shelter of the Lord in the same way that pleasure, fullness of the stomach, and relief from hunger are experienced simultaneously and progressively with each bite for a person engaged in eating. This is um, from the instructions of one of the Nabiugendras, I think maybe Kavi, well, it's either Kavi or Havi, one of the first two, um, to King Nimi uh, at the beginning of the 11th canto. Um, and um, Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur's um, tika on that explains that these things happen from the very uh, pleasure, nourishment, and relief from hunger, they happen with the very first morsel of rice. And they grow. The more you eat, the more uh, pleasure, the more nourishment, the more relief from hunger you, uh, you, uh, you experience. So in the same way, when you engage in devotional service, the more bhakti, the more direct experience of the Lord and um, the more detachment from absolutely everything else you experience. And then he points out a flaw in that analogy. You can't keep eating forever. Right? I mean, we experience that. How many times have we all said, I'm never going to have to eat again. I'm not going to have to, I can't eat for a whole week because I'm going to be digesting this feast um, you know, for the next week. Um, he says, but you can keep serving forever. So this is um, the unique power of bhakti. It's going to happen. This ecstasy will happen. Each flower in the garden has its own time to bloom. So it's going to happen. And as Maharaj was pointing out in his, uh, uh, his talk last night, and I do the same thing. When we talk about the third verse uh, of the Upadesha, uh, Upadesha Amrita, we, I emphasize these first three things. Um, utsahat, nischayat, and dhyayat. Enthusiasm, go for it. Nischayat, confidence, but it also implies persistence, steadiness, right? And patience. We shouldn't be impatient. We should know it will happen. Uh, um, as long as we, uh, as long you know, as long as we persist, we're going to keep making progress. Um, there are going to be bumps along the way. We see that in, especially in the early stages. Um, we see that in uh, Madhurya Kadambani, which is, I, I think, why Vishwana, uh, why Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur wrote that, so that we can understand kind of where we're at. Um, so this is, um, you know, this is what we see here is the stage of bhava. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Lord Nityananda certainly uh, exhibited that. And it's something that we will all attain to um, uh, eventually uh, if, we're, if we maintain our enthusiasm, our persistence, and some patience. I'll stop here because I'm already way in trouble. Quick comments, questions, anything? Hare Krishna. Thank you for another mic drop. Lecture. <laughs> Let's hope uh, that doesn't actually happen. Uh, uh, so, so my question is, uh, in the formation of the Bhakti Lata and the growth of the Bhakti Lata, devotee association is very important. Um, can you comment on devotee association uh, in person opposed to 
the association one gets watching uh, say this lecture online and being here in person. Yeah, it's an excellent question, and, and we discuss it all the time, and I think especially the last four years. Because there's, you know, the online sangha is something that was a little novel, a little kind of cool. We thought it was kind of cool um, up through 2019, and then beginning it early, very early in, 19, in, in 2020, it became our lifeline. Because we couldn't get we couldn't get it any other way. I mean, we had big signs on the temple in Honolulu that practically said "Go away," you know, temple closed. Because we didn't want the neighbors to see cars streaming into the temple and have them call the authorities and come shut us down. So we effectively kind of like chased away everyone that wasn't like madly persistent in in uh, in coming to the temple. Uh, and um, so the online sangha, and, and we find now that it's become the default. This temple room is to look different during um, during Srimad Bhagavatam class. Every temple room used to look quite different during Srimad Bhagavatam class. Los Angeles, especially when Srila Prabhupada was speaking, that room was packed. But even here in San Diego and in Honolulu, you know, we'd have two, three, four, two, three, four dozen people sometimes just at Sriman Bhagavatam class. Um, so that's become the default. People are watching me right now from goodness knows where. And, um, and you know, and I'll hear about it. Um, so, uh, and, and, and there's certainly some benefit because we're hearing transcendental sound. But I think what's a little harder to, to, to experience when we're not associating in person is that sharing of our hearts. It's harder for us to feel each other's hearts um, on YouTube, whether it's streaming live or, or recorded. It's possible sometimes. You can with some, I mean, I, I know that there's some devotees. When I have a, when, you know, well, we have, you, we have meetings uh, a couple times a week to discuss the nectar of devotion and bhakti rasamri to Sindhu. And I'd rather have those devotees there um, uh, by, through Zoom than not at all. Um, it's because they're, they're going to they're, they're, they're be participating, they're going to present their ideas. But it's so much more fun when we're in the room together. It's the difference between watching, say, the concert for George on video, right? I don't know if anybody's ever seen that, but it's especially when you're my age. Concert, concert for George, it was something that was held by his friends at the Royal Albert Hall about a year after George Harrison passed away. And it had two parts. It had an Indian part and a Western part. Uh, and the Indian part was uh, Anushka Shankar and, 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 a, and a symphony orchestra and, uh, and, and Indian musicians. Um, and yeah, and a lot of, there was chanting Hare Krishna. And, uh, and the second part was all of George's friends and his son, Dhani, playing his, uh, playing his music. And I always wonder how many devotees were in that audience. So that's one thing. Watching it on video is, is, is fun. But being there in the Royal Albert Hall, that's a completely... Anybody who's been to a live performance of a play or a live concert, whether classical music, folk music... I mean, when I was a teenager, I, I went to see Pete Seeger a couple of times in, in, uh, uh, at George Washington University. I lived in the Washington, D.C. area. And uh, whenever he would play in Washington, D.C., he would also have Mrs. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Cotton uh, come perform with him. Pardon? Who was he? Who? Pete Seeger? Oh, you wasted 25% of your life. <laughs> Pete Seeger was, the, the, he was like this folk music icon in the late 50s, 40s, late 50s. But there was this, in, in the U.S., there was this revival of American folk music. 
and, and actually kind of lead, it led to a lot of world music as well uh, in the U.S. late 50s um, into the mid, uh, kind of bleeding a little bit into the late 60s. And Pete Seeger was this icon of um, left-wing politics and, and, and people's music. And his concerts were actually sing-alongs. Everybody knew the songs that Pete was going to sing. And he, he, would, you know, he would encourage us to sing right along with them. Um, so that's a completely different experience from watching a Pete Seeger concert. A completely different experience. Because you're surrounded by people who are all singing with you. It's the same thing, you know, you watch one of the kirtans from a kirtan festival, like a sadhu sangha or a Radha Desh Mellows, and you can get carried away with it. You know, you're, some, there are a couple of kirtans that just break my heart wide open and make me cry. I, don't, I mean, once I thought, I, you know, I, I was listening to this one kirtan and I thought, okay, let me stop listening to this kirtan so I can chant japa and that maybe I'll stop crying then. And no, I, I mean, I, it's some, somehow or other just kind of launched a sort of chain reaction. But to have been, actually to have been in the room with Bada Hari and that kirtan, or uh, Janavi and Amala Harinam and Tulsi and another kirtan that I l uh, love listening to, that's a complete, or a Chuta Gopi, completely different experience, I'll tell you. So that's, it's, it's something to hanker for. But if we can get together and chant together, then we're, you know, then we're, we can, we're, we can actually feel each other's hearts as well. And I think that um, takes it up more than a couple of notches. Thank you. It's a, it's a great question. And, I mean, it's something that's always being discussed nowadays. But now that those, you know, the streaming, watching uh, live streams or, or recordings has become the default. It's a constant um, topic of conversation nowadays. Debate, argument, whatever, you know. Pyachandra Prabhu. Um, thank you for the class. Uh, at the end of class, you mentioned about uh, that uh, um, Krishna uh, consider devo uh, give devotees some faults, not uh, this is different faults uh, like uh, usual people, common people. And when devotee, it seems like false, but uh, you said that um, Krishna uh, sent these some situations. And um, my question is, uh, from which level devotee it works? Uh, it's, Be oh, beginning at which stage does yeah, Krishna yeah, yeah. take control? Yeah. yeah. Uh, to some, at least to some small extent at the beginning, according to... Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur's reading of this. Um, and, um, you know, Srila Prabhupada trans that, translates that verse, Dikshakale um, Bhaktakore Atma Samarpan, as when the devotee surrenders. But I also think of it as as the devotee surrenders, because it's an ongoing thing. That engaging in Sharanga Sharanagati, it's, it's ongoing, like Bhakti, right? Um, uh, it's a uh, Krishna Anushilanam. It's an ongoing activity intended to give pleasure to Krishna. So Sharanagati, you know, we begin where we are, and we even more deeply accept things that are favorable for devotional service, neglect things that aren't. We develop develop a deeper sense that Krishna will protect us, protect us in all circumstances, that He is our sole maintainer. And we um, more and more uh, give up all personal interest, atmani kshepa, atmani vedana, uh, give up all in personal interest in the interest of the Lord and progressively uh, develop humility. We become more and more humble. So as Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur points out here, we become haunted, uh, that, that, that haunting by rasa, even though using the word rasagraha makes it sound like it's very high, he says it begins at least to some, at, to some extent. At, at, and Vish, uh, Jiva Goswami argues in his Bhakti Sandarbha that even sadhana bhakti, he's arguing from those verses in the second, um, second chapter of the Bhagavatam that the Acharyas tell us describe the nine stages of bhakti. And he says, 
out of seven verses in there, six and a half of those verses actually describe sadhana bhakti. So, and then he, and then he, his conclusion is, listen, if sadhana bhakti didn't have some degree of control over Krishna, how would it compel him to give the devotee bhava bhakti? So that's kind of his bottom line. Um, it's a really, uh, really, you know, I mean, I found it a fascinating thing to explore, and I'm going to have to somehow or other get rid of everything else for a little while and get a, a, a rather long, involved article going on it, because otherwise I don't think I can, I don't think I'll be able to die peacefully without doing that. I have a, I have a few projects, so if you all can help me maintain my health for the next 20, 25 years, I'd, I'd be very grateful, because i got stuff to do. Anything else? The hour is growing late. Thank you all so much for your indulgence and your patience. Grantaraja Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Gaur Bhaktivrinda ki jai. Pancha Kalpataru Vishra Kapasin. Pancha Kalpataru Vishra Kapasin. Pancha Kalpataru Vishra Kapasin.